Hello folks, this is Tom from anti-proton.com and when you think of nuclear material usually you think of something like this some nuclear check sources right here, these kinds of things things that have big signs on them that look like that and that read on devices like this but what you may not be thinking of all the time is something like this Grandpa's old compass now let me tell you something, these sorts of things like this compass can be quite radioactive. In fact, uh, watches too. Anything from the early 1900s, 1910, 20, somewhere in there, up to in the, even as late as the 1970s, even very early 1980s, can contain nuclear material. In this case, this guy is radioactive. This uh, compass belongs to my father, and I found it and decided to bring it in and show you guys. So um, here I am finding it. All right, when hunting through grandpa's stuff, and sometimes uh, fathers and such, and of course uh, mothers and things too, you will find radioactive material often. Why? Because old people have lots of radioactive stuff, because back in the olden days, they didn't realize that radioactive stuff was horribly deadly. But that's okay, this is the modern day, where we now know that that's completely terrible. And it doesn't take too long before somebody comes across something like this. Now, as you can see, this is making the scintillator go bananas. Let's see what the Geiger counter thinks. The Geiger counter is at half a count per second. Let me open up the back here and put it near this thing, and we'll see what we get. Not that much. Why is that? Because only the strongest gamma rays are making it outside of the housing. The beta and alpha emissions are being blocked inside. So we're picking up some x-rays and some gamma rays at about... 70, 80, maybe even as much as 100 counts per minute, which isn't very much. That's not very much at all. Let's cut the light on here. But when we put this under the gamma spectrometer, we can figure out why this thing is radioactive. So it depends on kind of what you're looking for. If it's a depression glass, you can pick it up pretty easily with a Geiger counter. For something like this, sometimes you can, sometimes you won't. This is an old compass, circa a long time ago. 1944-ish, probably. Something like that. I'm having the owner who owns it behind me telling me this. He's voicing this information to me as we speak, although you probably can't hear it, and that's fine because he's in the background holding the camera. But as you can see, the Polymaster instantly notices that this is here. Although it doesn't really put off much radiation. Wait till we get this back in the lab and take a look at what it puts off. You'll discover it's a lot hotter than you think it is. Now as you can see, it has marks on the bottom of it right here. Let's try to move in and see if we can take a look at what those marks say. It says TGCO170 London NOB is in beta uh, 2692444 I think and then it says 1944 uh, looks like mark 3. So that's what this guy is quite an interesting little device. We can go ahead and open it up really quickly. As you can see, it's all it's really, really nice quality. It opens up. It's all nice and glass and everything. Now, it is radioactive, and the question is, of course, why is it radioactive? And we can quickly oops, we can quickly see why it's radioactive by doing gamma spectroscopy. So let's, let's see how it tests, like what how it uh, shows up. All right, for starters, let's use an x-ray probe. So what I have right here is a thin crystal cesium iodide x-ray probe, a little tiny one. Um, this is good for x-rays, and this is connected to a Ludlum Model 12 rate meter. So uh, we have this on the times 10 position, which means that we're at 0, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 counts per minute. So let me twist this out of your way a little bit. So this is 0 to 5,000 counts per minute. So we got this guy open right here, this neat little compass. It's cut on the sound, and as you can see, we are put in a quick response. We're somewhere around... Um, 800 counts per minute, 600 counts per minute. When we put the x-ray probe near it, what do we get? Almost 5,000 counts per minute. So that's the kind of x-rays this thing is putting off. Let's see if it's putting off gamma rays. 
All right, now I have a one inch sodium iodide probe connected to it. And as you can see on our scale, we're on uh, times 10 again, so it's zero to 5,000 counts per minute. And our background right here is sitting around maybe 3,500 counts per minute if I get the probe away from the, the uh, source here. Uh, so, cut the sound. And we put this near it and we go hard over. So, let's cut the sound off and let's switch this thing to times 100. So now we're at zero, we'll zero it out. Zero. Uh, 10,000, 20, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 counts per minute. This is in counts per minute, so let's cut the sound on. And let's try this again. Gamma rays. Gamma rays and x-rays, actually. Technically both. 10,000. 12,000. Let's get right up on it. 14,000. And since we're at 14,000, and since uh, we're talking about a 3,000 or so background, uh, so this thing's about 10,000 counts per minute gamma plus or minus. Not bad. Now they don't register very well. Oopsie! Look at that. The little metal ring fell off. And that's something you got to watch out for because if the if if this thing pops open and this liquid that's inside of it comes out, that liquid has whatever the radioactive material in it is, well mixed. And of course I know exactly what the material is. It's radium 226. But we'll look it up in just a second. So if you take something like this old CDV 700, even with the beta probe open, um, you'll notice it doesn't really register that much. Like a little, but if you have this, sh this uh, front here closed, you don't get anything off of it at all. Nothing. So I would stick with something like the Ludlum this if you're going to try to detect this thing. EXP with a uh, pancake probe. And it normally gets 38 counts per minute in the lab, more or less, but we're already at 100 because we're kind of over here near this thing, so let's get closer. The alpha shield is open, so we're going to pick up. Probably not alphas at all because the glass will block them. I mean, I'm sure like one or two might get through, but this is going to be mostly weak betas and x-rays. There's my cat lab assistant, Driss, complaining that he's not a part of this. You've got your own research projects, Driss. Poor lab assistant, Driss. He's always trying to get mixed up in all the research. He wants to make his resume look better. So as you can see, around 650 counts per minute is what we're going to get off of this. Um, if we're looking at gamma only, much lower. Geiger counters are not very sensitive to gamma, and this is going to slow down to almost background. All right, so let's toss this in the spectrometer, and um, the spectrometer is over here. Let All right, me so here's the uh, spectrometer. I don't have my lead castle set up for this guy right this moment. This is a sodium iodide uh, 1.5 inch thallium dope scintillation counter, and it's um, of course, obviously good for to be a spectrometer as well with a little lead around it. We're going to stick this guy inside of here, nice and covered up in plastic, and run it through my Spectrum Techniques UCS30 uh, Universal Computer Spectrometer. It's a gamma spectrometer. It's 1,024 channels. And we're going to take a look at it, and I'm going to show you the video of it collecting the data and what we get. By the way, the gloves are for this, just to make sure I don't get any liquid on me that has this radium in it. I've been constantly checking myself. Uh, contamination checking myself with the um, Geiger counter here, which is kind of like what its major point is and its major function. And nothing seems to be spilling out of this. I've done a lot of swipe tests and things on it, but it's always a good idea. You don't have to worry about that so much when you have something like a sealed source like this because the gloves don't do anything to protect you for these. And none of that's going to get on you anyway. All right, so we've got the compass in the detector. We're going to check the power. Uh, we're getting ready to run for one hour here, but it's not going to be an hour for you guys because of magic. All right, so uh, power's good. Now let's go and check the time, and that should be one hour, and like I said, magic. We're going to move into the future really quickly with the amazing power of video editing. And back to the future, here we go. Amazingly, the video editing works since I'm using PowerDirector 10, which is basically the worst software ever created. Okay, radium-226 comes in nicely, bismuth-214, lead-214, and potassium-40. That's the K40 on the, left, on the uh, right side. So this is an obvious radium-226 spectrum. You notice that the bismuth-14 is a little bit lower than it needs to be. The radium-226 is a little bit higher than it needs to be uh, for this to be a uranium spectrum, which is otherwise what it would look like. And if I had just seen this without knowing, I might be fooled temporarily. Anyway, now that we've gotten the data, and I probably could have gotten this in about 30 seconds, this is a pretty strong system. Let's uh, highlight the X-ray fluorescence. We'll highlight the bismuth 214 and put this in the linear mode. We can fly down here. Where is it? There we go. We get the potassium 40. Boom. 
And now we can do a three-point calibration mapping energy to channel, which is also kind of useful. So this takes a little while, but I'm doing it really fast for you because magic. Okay, magic, magic, magic. So this is obviously radium-226. That are some really strange, funky-looking uranium, which it's not. So anyhow, but knowledge is power, and now we know. Yay for gamma spectroscopy.